Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Reacteria. I know that it's awfully quick for me to be putting out another video right now, but that last one was an hour long, and I thought it might be kind of nice to have a little normal style one as well, so you can watch something on your lunch break without having to dedicate a whole evening to it. I don't know, man. Also, I have like a huge list here of videos that you guys have been sending me that I need to react to, and I'm very happy about that. But while looking at my old lists, I found the playlist of John and Jane again, and I saw this one, which is called Adaptation, and I feel like I know what arguments they're gonna make. I feel like they're gonna talk about like micro versus macro evolution because that's what they all say. And I felt like maybe that would be like a cool thing for us to get into because that's a big sticking point for a lot of people. And also, I wanted to shout out a couple of people in this video. The first group that I really wanted to mention was my patrons on Patreon. There's over a hundred of them now. And while they're gonna be in the credits roll at the end of the video, just like they were in the last one, I wanted to make sure to shout them out at the beginning as well, because I miss doing that, you know? They deserve so much recognition for making this whole dream a reality. So sincerely, thank you, patrons. And the second group that I wanted to shout out is the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. <laughs> I'm genuinely stoked to be sponsored by NordVPN because I use them on all of my devices every single day. That editing computer over there, this laptop in front of me, my cell phone, anything that connects to the internet, I have NordVPN on because my data is my business. Have you ever been passionately curious about biology? It makes your Google history weird because sometimes it's four in the morning and you just, you need to know the particulars of earthworm sex or what species of fungi can grow on an embalmed cadaver. And nobody needs to know about that but me. Do you know what buttress drumming is? Do you know why it's so important for chimpanzee culture? You don't, but you could. But before you look it up, you need to make sure that your data is encrypted so that the people who provide your internet don't think you're weird. So I use NordVPN every single day to keep my excessively strange search history safe from the weirdos who want to track it. I also use it to watch things like Rick and Morty on Netflix, because that's not available in America, but if I switch my VPN over to Australia, then Netflix thinks I'm in Australia, and it is available there, and I can watch every single episode. But hey, that's a normal thing. What I'm saying is, you can use it for the reason we should all be using it. And you can do these things too, just by going to nordvpn.com slash Labs, or click the link in the description below. And the best part is, it's actually a rad deal that they're offering. It's over 70% off a two-year plan, plus an additional month free. So take your finances and your internet security seriously, and go to nordvpn.com slash Labs. Alright, with that, let's get into the video, because I am dying to hear what John and Jane have to say this time. Is it just me, or has the evolution from one kind of animal into another never been seen? Okay, we could be off to an exceedingly bad start here. Because that phrase, from one kind of animal to another, is a minefield. Because what she could be saying, what she's probably saying, is just a colloquial way of saying one species of animal to another. But she could also be about to pull a Ray Comfort. And I really, really, really hope she isn't. Because Ray Comfort's whole thing is that in the Bible it says that each creature was created according to its kind. And that there's a dog kind and a frog kind and a, a whale kind and a turtle kind. And that if you see one bird evolve into another bird or a lizard evolve into another lizard or a fish evolve into a different fish, that that's not really evolution because they didn't change kinds. And that unless you see a cat evolve into an ostrich, you haven't really seen true evolution and that your belief in evolution is all just faith. And that while faith is extremely important for him and his beliefs, in every other circumstance it's bad. And it just... it. This opens the door for them to pull a Ray Comfort, and I really, I really, really hope that they don't pull a Ray Comfort. So Darwin's finches left South America, traveled to the Galapagos Islands, and over time, each island developed its own species. But is that really evolution? Aw, oh, Jane, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't pull a Ray Comfort. Come on, you're better than that. I mean that sincerely. You were always the smart one in this series. I mean, I know they always had John be the one to, like, teach you everything, but that's just because of the whole patriarchy thing. That man can barely speak. Jane. 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 Look at it. Got a new app for my phone. Flashlight. You see what I mean? He's amazed by a flashlight, Jane. I love this phone. 
It's got like everything you need on it. It's got GPS, it's got constellations. Can it make me a puppy? <laughs> yeah. Oops, uh, wrong icon. I'll have them on in just a second. Jane? Witch! 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 No way! Uh-uh, no! There you are! Oh, man. Oh, is she back? Oh, it's just a talk. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. I was a believer for a second. Don't we look cute together? Yeah, the resemblance is <clears throat> frightening. He couldn't remember the word impeccable. The line was, the resemblance is impeccable. And he couldn't remember the word impeccable. You, you cannot convince me that isn't what just happened. Your smartphone is pretty amazing, but it can only do things it's programmed to do. <gasps> hey, that's it. That's the difference. What, what's the difference? Um, I've been reading through a textbook and they keep giving great examples of how creatures change, like Darwin's finches or these tortoises. But this isn't evolution by natural forces if these animals were programmed to adapt like that. Okay, so maybe she's not pulling a Ray Comfort? What programming are they talking about? I see what you're saying. Many evolutionists consider any change as evolution, which makes it seem like we're always evolving upward. No evolutionist says that, because there is no evolving upwards. That's not how anything works, John. Put the smart one back on. But not all changes come from accidental errors through mutation. Some pre-programmed variation helps animals adapt through genetic recombining. Pre-programmed variation that causes adaptation through recombination. That sounds an awful lot like genetic drift. Like it sounds like that's what they're trying to talk about. You see, when you have a population, a group of organisms, all the same species, they each have genes and those genes kind of vary a little bit. So the total metagenome has some variation in it. And as they continue to reproduce and recombine their genes, these genes get shuffled around. And so you have this drift in the metagenome where the allele frequencies kind of just drift back and forth. That genetic drift will inevitably lead to deleterious genes being kind of filtered out and better genes, so to speak, becoming the dominant strain within the population. It sounds like that's what they're talking about. And that is a form of evolution. They just phrased it and defined it as weirdly as they possibly could. So mutations would be accidents, errors? Right. Mutations are usually caused when there's an error copying a creature's genetic information, which is found in its DNA. It can lose, duplicate, or even copy letters in the genetic code. This is off topic, but I don't like how slimy that DNA was. Did you like how slimy that DNA was? Let me know in the comments below whether or not you liked how slimy that DNA was. I did not like how slimy that DNA was. But if I delete, scramble, or duplicate letters, won't I eventually get a new word? Sure, but a new word doesn't necessarily mean anything. So if I scramble the letters in puppy, It just means gibberish? Exactly. Mutations might be able to create a new combination of letters, but it needs to have a meaning for the cell to use as a blueprint later on. In other words, a code isn't really a code without some assigned meaning. Gibberish can't create anything. Yeah, but there's lots of different kinds of mutations. Mutation doesn't just mean scrambling around letters randomly. It actually... Hold on. All right, I just went to my study and drew this up for you. This is how your DNA works. It codes for amino acids, which string together to make proteins. How does it know which amino acid it's making? Well, it uses three letter sequences called codons. So here's the first letter, here's the second letter, and here's the third letter. So let's say, for example, you had a codon that said uracil, cytosine. Now it doesn't matter what the third letter is, that's always going to code for a serine, no matter what. So you could have any number of mutations on this third letter, 
nothing's going to happen. It's always going to be serine. So the protein that it makes is always going to be the same. So we call that a silent mutation. If, however, you changed the first letter from uracil down to cytosine, well now, no matter what, this amino acid is going to be a proline. This codon is now coding for proline no matter what. And that will change what the protein is in the end. So we call that a missense mutation. If you took this serine codon and you changed the second letter from cytosine to adenine, well now one of two things could happen. If it ended with a uracil or a cytosine, you've now made tyrosine. So that's another missense mutation. If it ended with adenine or guanine, you've now made a stop codon, which stops the production of the rest of the protein. So this is what we call a nonsense mutation. Those can be really dangerous. So here we've got point mutations, one single letter being changed with three possible outcomes, either silent, missense, or nonsense. Now take a look at this sequence over here. Here's a really easy sequence for you to follow. A, B, C, D, E. This is a point mutation. Just one letter gets changed. Again, that can have three different outcomes. This is a duplication event where one piece of DNA gets copied twice. This is a deletion event where one piece of DNA doesn't get copied at all. This is an inversion event where a piece of DNA gets copied backwards. This is a translocation event where a piece of DNA from somewhere else in your genome, some other chromosome, accidentally gets crammed in here. And again, any one of those could do nothing or they could do something. And that something could be either good or bad. So it's not just rearranging the letters in the word puppy and coming up with gibberish. It is a very, very complicated code of over 20 different words with three different letters between them, with 64 different ways to spell them. It is not a direct analog to English, you chicken nugget of a person. So mutations are always bad? Yeah. Look at what it says. Some mutations, such as those that cause genetic diseases, may be lethal. Other mutations may lower fitness by decreasing an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. Still, other mutations may improve an individual's ability to survive and reproduce. Wow! You pulled that right out of the textbook, man. I guess that means that we can all just ignore the fact that you glossed over the word some while defending the argument that all mutations are bad. I wonder what literally the next sentence of that textbook says. How common are mutations? Recent estimates suggest that each of us is born with roughly 300 mutations that make parts of our DNA different than that of our parents. Most of those mutations are neutral. One or two are potentially harmful. A few may be beneficial. Golly, it sure is rough that all mutations are bad and will cause us to not be able to reproduce, seeing as how each and every one of us has around 300 of them. I don't even have to tell you why you're wrong. You put it in your own video. All this proves is that if you actually read the books that you're trying to debunk, you wouldn't believe the things that you do. It looks like they agree that mutations are bad, but then why do they say some may improve an individual? They give you an example right here. Over the past 20 years, mutations in the mosquito genome have made many African mosquitoes resistant to the chemical pesticides once used to control them. Okay, so it looks like the mosquitoes are better off because of mutation. Yes. And you stop right there. And that's where you end the sentence. They're better off because of mutation? Yes, and that's the whole thing. You don't need to say any more. <laughs> But what they don't tell you is that resistance actually came from a loss of information in the mosquito's genetic code. The mosquito's ability to control its enzyme production is now messed up, and one of the strange side effects of too many enzymes is increased pesticide resistance. However, normal mosquitoes without the disease are much healthier in the wild where there is no pesticide. First of all, enzymes are molecules with extremely specific functions. You can't just have too many enzymes and now you gain a superpower. Each enzyme does a specific thing. That makes no sense. Second of all, evolution is not a disease. I don't know why you chose to phrase that that way. Thirdly, of course they wouldn't survive back in natural conditions. They evolved for these conditions. So if you put them back in those conditions, they're not suited for those anymore. Whales evolved from land animals. That doesn't mean I can just take a whale and plop it on the land and expect it to thrive. That wouldn't make any sense. Fourth and most importantly, what? So it was a loss of information, but it was a benefit for those mosquitoes, right? Well, they only benefit by being more resistant to the pesticide. But that's the whole... Yeah! 
That's what the mutation did. It made them more resistant to the pesticide. That's a benefit. The point is, by losing information, they lost control of an enzyme's production. Now evolution needs to explain gains of information over time. I swear by Darwin's beard, I did not plan this. That is almost word for word what Kevin Anderson said in the last episode. I think these guys are sharing notes. I am docking points for plagiarism. But if a population of creatures continues to lose information, could it be deadly for them? Bingo! But here's the real problem. People count on that loss of information from mutations to create the genetic blueprint for every living creature on Earth out of nothing. That's crazy. No way! That's so impossible! It destroys evolution! Right? <laughs> no we don't! And no it doesn't! Even if we did! Even if we did only talk about just loss of genetic information, this is still showing a clear phenotypic benefit. So, like, what are you even talking about? Like, if I tell you that I bought a hamburger, you can't just turn around and say, well, you only lost money, and you didn't explain where you got the money in the first place, and you can't get a hamburger in the wild, therefore economics don't exist. What? <laughs> what are you doing? Okay, so what about the other changes? Program change, or you, you called it genetic recombination. Look at what it says here. Most heritable differences are due not to mutations, but to genetic recombination. So, God not only created all the animals, he also packed them with enough genetic information that would allow them to adapt to different environments and varieties we see today. So adaptation is real? Yeah, I, I saw an explanation of it in the Focus on Earth Science. Individuals with characteristics that are poorly suited to the environment are less likely to survive and reproduce. Over time, poorly suited characteristics may disappear from the species. Stick with me here, because I'm not messing with you. That is called natural selection. What you just described and said was real is exactly what Darwin wrote about. What are we doing here? Also, that whole last part about how poorly suited characteristics will just disappear, wouldn't that be a loss of information? If, if they're just losing information all the time, eventually there'll be nothing left, right? Loss of information doesn't tell us anything about where the information came from in the first place, right? Like, do you guys think about these things before you say them? Or at all? Animals can express a lot of variety. But there's a limit because of the finite genetic information they have. Exactly. And while we've seen some pretty amazing varieties within the kinds God created, like in dogs, one basic kind of animal can never change into another. Oh no, they circled back. This is exactly what I was afraid of at the very beginning. Don't do this. Don't pull away comfort. Please, don't do this. Although they like to point out the differences in finch beaks and tortoises. It's just adaptation within the genetic limits of that kind. Right but then they pass it off as evolution. Studying changes in a beak shape, like Darwin's finches, won't show you where that beak came from. And despite the minor changes, a finch is still just a finch. But the truth is what we read in Genesis 1.25. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Well, you did it, Jane. You pulled away comfort. I hope you're proud of yourself. Because my heart is broken. I believed in you, Jane. We all believed in you. You were the chosen one. You're supposed to destroy the creationists, not join them. Bring balance to science. Not leave it in darkness. You were my brother, Jane. I loved you. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Ugh. Well, this has been incredibly disappointing. I thought they were going to make one bad argument. They ended up making a much, much worse argument. And for a minute there, I thought maybe they were going to say something original and playful and fun, but man, they, they let me down hard. 
anybody with a basic understanding of biology can see how they're misrepresenting and misusing really crucial vocab words. Their own book contradicted them at one point, and then they just straight up ripped off other arguably worse apologists. So considering all of this, I gotta give them a science teacher challenge level two out of 10. That's just bad. You did bad, guys. Wrong. Don't do that again. And with that, thank you so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for subscribing, and all the other stuff that you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on the way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. If you like terrible podcasts, I've got one of those linked down in the description below. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye.